All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, it's 10.30. Let's go ahead and, and get started. So you are in the, the hybrid cloud track. I am Brian Cantrell. I'm the, the, the CTO of Joyent. And uh, this track is dedicated to a rather renegade hypothesis, and namely that, that Jeff Bezos is not going to own and operate every computer on the planet, um, and it, which is nothing but respect for, for what Amazon has built, of course. Um, but it doesn't sound that renegade when you phrase it that way, and yet we are in an era where everyone kind of assumes that there's no reason to have a computer that's not sitting in a public cloud. But um, there are actually reasons to own and operate your own computer or to, to, to straddle two different public clouds, to straddle public cloud and private cloud, uh, public cloud and the edge. And we're going to hear all of that today. So we, we've got a track where we're going to hear a bunch of different perspectives on why hybrid cloud. And then we even have an anti-talk at the end of the day. Um, so I would encourage you to, to stick around for that. But we are going to uh, kick it off with Alex Galt from uh, PitchBook, who's going to talk about data on steroids. Alex, take it away. All right. You guys hear me okay? All right, cool. Uh, so yeah, just like you said, uh, my name is Alex. Uh, I head up products at PitchBook. And today I want to talk a little bit about how we've undertaken a migration uh, actually to a hybrid cloud approach and along the way adopted uh, kind of a service-oriented approach as well. And so uh, yeah, don't let my title scare you. I know you were hoping to see like an engineer up here. Like every AWS session I've been, I'm hoping for an engineering title. Um, so product management is fairly technical role at PitchBook. This is a technical talk, so hopefully I'll deliver on that. Um, just to get into it, I think quickly, if you understand what PitchBook does, it'll help lend uh, some understanding to my examples in just a little bit. So we provide financial data for both the public and private markets. So you can think about anytime a startup raises like a Series A, we're going to know what was the valuation of that. We're going to know who is the founder. Uh, we're going to know which VC invested in that. Same thing on the public market. We're going to be able to get stock prices, balance sheets, SEC filings, things like that. So our customers are usually investors uh, who want to make a decision on if a company is actually a good bet to put their money in. So for PitchBook, what that means is that the, our ability to add new data sets, whether it's actual financials uh, that people use to make a decision or other data points that give context to that, uh, it's really important to be able to do that quickly for us. And so a lot of our systems and a lot of our business decisions are driven on, on that fact, is that we want to be adding new data sets as quickly and easily as possible. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. I want to talk about how we went from kind of being a monolith up on Rackspace over to adopting both AWS and Rackspace uh, and adopting a hybrid cloud approach. So since we've done this migration, I've had a lot of talks with folks. Um, some of them pointed out some things that they think that we did wrong. Some folks are actually encouraged by some of the things that we did. So I'm hoping this talk inspires some of you, so maybe you can avoid some of our mistakes. Uh, maybe if you're on the fence, it inspires you to go forward with some kind of migration. Uh, or maybe one of you is going to find me after the session and be like, really, this is what you need to be doing, and we'll totally go that way. So uh, either way, I think one of us is going to get something out of this, uh, and it'll be a pretty great talk. Uh, Important to start with why. Uh, why did we actually do this? There's lots of writing out there on why to go uh, to a hybrid cloud approach, why to adopt a microservices or service-oriented approach. And I think for us, it boiled down to a couple main things. Number one is we had teams, two teams in Europe, one in Seattle, all trying to work on the same system, same code base, and that was kind of creating a lot of fights. The team that had been there the longest called most of the shots just because they'd been there the longest. Um, so everybody's supposed to work on Java. Everybody's supposed to be on Rackspace. We like the way things are set up because they said so. Uh, not the best reason for that. And so a lot of these teams had different missions and priorities. We'd started to delve into data science. Uh, and those teams maybe wanted to work in a different stack. They had some different needs than everybody else did. Uh, these varied tech stacks didn't play as nicely or it wasn't as clean as we wanted it to be trying to make it all live uh, on the same system. And at the same time, I think there was an emphasis on just getting to market faster. We were growing a ton, and so the speed was starting to slow down on delivering new features. Uh, communication took longer between the teams. Uh, every change to the system was taking longer, so uh, there was an emphasis for us to just start delivering faster, and we wanted to be able to enable that. I think lastly, um, firefighting just became awful. Like Every time the system went down, it's like everybody had to get involved, um, and that was pretty terrible for us. Uh, I think at the same time, I didn't have a good answer uh, to the question of what happened if our data center just fell into a sinkhole. Like, if you guys, do you guys get security surveys from like any of your vendors or anything? There's a question on there. It's like, what do you do if your main data center goes down or like, yeah, one guy put it to me, falls in a sinkhole. 
I had no answer for that question. I was like, well, Rackspace says they have a clause in here. It's going to help us out and they'll get us back up in 24 hours. Um, believing that in a worst case scenario wasn't the most comfortable thing for us. So for all these reasons, we decided that we were going to make a move. This is kind of what our plan looked like. Um, a couple of things I want to hit on here is first, the timelines are kind of rough. I'm trying to recreate what it sort of looked like and some of the main steps here. Uh, definitely would advocate taking a phased approach if you're going to do this. Um, and what this will allow you to do is try to couple some, some new features, something that uh, the executives can actually see, that your customers can actually see and touch. If you can deliver some new features along with uh, anything that you're re-architecting or systems that you're moving, it's going to make all this effort a little more palatable. Uh, that's a double-edged sword, though, because if you decide, oh, we're moving this new architecture, we might as well redesign the whole thing, um, you're going to add so much complexity to the project that it's not going to be worth it. So I think there's a fine line there, but something that really helped us get buy-in uh, was the promise of actually delivering not just uh, reliability and teams moving faster, but actually delivering some new functionality, some new features along with this. So definitely something I advocate you guys to look at. Um, at the outset, we said, okay, every new project from now on, we stop and we say, is this something that could live on a different cloud? And is this something that deserves to live as its own service or how or we can we split it into different services? So every project needs to be considered from the new mindset from here on out. As we were spitting up our data, our data science team, uh, the first thing we wanted to do is say, hey, let's actually just put them on Amazon um, and, and we'll get into some reasons on why that made sense for them. But let's just put them over on AWS and set a default on Rackspace and we'll make sure that they have the right tools for the job that they're actually going to be doing. Um, so definitely try to consider it and, and don't just by default add to your legacy system or add to the other cloud. Try to think in hybrid cloud for every single change that you have moving forward. Um, Rehosting, I thought was a great teacher. So just lifting and dropping applications off of Rackspace and onto AWS. Um, it's not going to work perfectly, and I'll show you some specific examples of why that's the case, but it's one of the best teachers that you can have. Um, lifting up its system, dropping it onto another cloud, looking at the performance, monitoring that really well, that's going to teach you a lot about where your bottlenecks are, where some of your technical choices are going to be limiting. Um, it's going to teach you where some of your team structure is going to be limiting. Um, so doing this early is really going to help you uh, get some familiarity and understand what it's going to take to get your entire application uh, to be more portable, or at least the parts that you do want to move. Um, identify some technical choices. Uh, that maybe are limiting for moving. So for us, uh, SQL Server was something that we relied on pretty heavily. Scaling that horizontally is just not going to make sense cost-wise. Um, same thing where we were running on Windows for a lot of folks, and we wanted to get over to Linux, get over to Postgres on things that could scale horizontally for systems that we were going to scale out. Um, so making sure you identify which of these systems uh, is going to need uh, some kind of migration like that is really important to do early on. Uh, next, we took some of our natural candidates for like a service-oriented approach or could live on another cloud, and we put them there. Those applications that kind of live in a silo by themselves, maybe they don't have a lot of dependencies on other applications or other teams. Um, definitely those are the ones to focus on moving first as you're going to learn a ton from those uh, that can help you tackle the main app. Cool. So with that overview of the plan, uh, none of that really matters if you don't change your team structure. Uh, for us, it looked more like this middle image here. Um, we had one or two, we called them the masterminds, but like kind of the lead technical minds um, in the company. And everything really went through them in the engineering department, right? And then we had all our front end lead, all our front end team was kind of one big blob. We had our back end team was one big blob. Our data team was one big blob. The problem is if you start putting people on different systems and you say, hey, you can actually, uh, we're going to take you out. You're going to be responsible for your own service, your own code. You can make whatever technical choices you want, whatever code stack, whatever cloud stack, whatever you want. Um, this system really doesn't work. Uh, and it's easy to draw on paper and say, oh, yeah, we're going to put you as a team and we're going to have a strong team lead and that's all going to work. Um, for us, this was the most painful part. We could not find people that wanted to be good team leads. Um, there were some people that we had to actually motivate to become team leads, some people we had to coach out of the organization, some people we had to bring in. There was hard conversations we had to have with the masterminds about maybe what their new role was going to be within the company now that every change and every piece of code that was written, they weren't going to be involved in. So uh, I would say this is one of the most painful parts and to really not ignore uh, what your organization looks like before the migration and what it's going to need to look like after the migration to realize any of these results. Um, lastly, just, just quickly, a, a point on, on Agile and kind of moving quickly is when you get teams and you, know, you bring some team on say, hey, you're going to be able to work on whatever you want and move as quickly as you want, and that's the emphasis, um, realize that because you're phasing this out, there's some teams that are still going to be stuck 
um, on a monolith or a non-ideal architecture. And so one team's going to be moving really fast. And they mean in a bunch of changes from your team uh, that's still on some other system and realize they're not going to be able to make those changes right away. They can't just constantly be acquiescing to the needs of the one team that's moving at 1,000 miles an hour unless they're only your top priority. And so you're going to need some methods to deal with these differences in SLAs between teams. Um, I'll show you a specific example later of how we did it, but I think also really important to remember. So team structure, I can't stress this enough. This took us way too long to figure out. Um, we probably could have shaved at least six months off of this thing if we had thought about it ahead of time. Uh, I've talked about AWS a fair amount as, uh, already, and I just want to talk a little bit about why we went with them. We actually do use Google Cloud like in our test environments, um, along with Rackspace and AWS, AWS as well, but in production, it's just Rackspace and AWS. Um, being in Seattle, you guys might have seen a lot of these reasons before uh, already, given the AWS folks are kind of everywhere, but we really do like the managed services. Um, for our data science teams especially, we don't want them worried about implementing queues. We don't want them worried about spinning up servers. A lot of this can be done via an interface with AWS. So it's very simple to keep them focused on what they're supposed to be doing, like what actually makes a difference um, for that team, which is making really good models that are good at predicting whatever we want it to predict. So uh, we really like the fact that there's managed services in so many of them. And the fact that they just play nicely together. Um, through that interface, you can actually kind of point and click and make a lot of these services play pretty well together. If you want to put them in the same networks and security groups, uh, provisioning access, all of that is actually fairly easy to manage through AWS and doesn't take uh, maybe a whole team like it does on, on some systems for Rackspace for us. Um, high pace innovation is super nice. So they're adding tons of services every single year. We don't use them all, but I do like the option that if we do want to go play with something like Amazon Lex and say that we want to get into like some natural language understanding or whatever that is of a, of a user's input, we can actually spin up a prototype on one of their services pretty quick and even understand if this is something we want to do. So we may not use all of their services, um, but I do like the fact that at least the option is there to play around. Um, and lastly, just the network in Seattle especially is fantastic. Like the amount of meetups there are for AWS, uh, the amount of AWS people that are here in Seattle is huge. Uh, and even on Stack Overflow, it's got a gigantic community. So uh, definitely for us, putting this all together was a huge reason to go with AWS. Not a magic bullet though. Not, not at all a magic bullet. This will not solve all your problems. Uh, we rehosted onto AWS one of our processes called Publisher. And so what this did is it took our research database where we was putting data all day. It's super uh, write optimized. And it would transform that data, uh, do like some currency calculations, things like that. And it would put it into a bunch of read optimized databases. So that process took about six hours on Rackspace. Pretty intensive, a lot of data going. Uh, we just dropped it on an Amazon instance of similar sizes that we could find, uh, and we got an 18-hour running process on that right away. Uh, and so, again, you can't, it's not as simple as just lifting something over and putting it onto another cloud, and you can expect the same performance. Uh, one key thing for us is when you're trying to figure out why uh, these systems are running differently, uh, actually a couple things. One is that a lot of the, a lot of the uh, performance of these machines is a best-case scenario, so it's not always going to be that. Uh, if you implement things like system level, like OS level logging, along with CloudWatch logging, you're going to get a really clear picture of how each instance and service is actually performing, and it'll help you troubleshoot your bottlenecks a little bit better. Um, so some things might be network, some things might be the actual disks, like our, our DevOps guys, they curse the disks at AWS all the time. Um, I'm not convinced that's always uh, the right thing, but... Uh, there's a lot of different reasons depending on the needs of your application that are going to cause differences when you're moving from one cloud to another. So uh, definitely I encourage you to do this, but just don't expect that it's going to work. This is going to be a good teacher to rehost uh, right away. So a little happier story. I want to talk about the roots of our data science team and how they've moved. So back in the day, they would write uh, some kind of model. Maybe it would extract uh, entities and news. So you have some news article that comes in. And they say, oh yeah, Uber was mentioned in this article, Twitter was mentioned in this article, LinkedIn was mentioned in this article. So they have some model that's doing that. Um, they would send that to the offshore team, uh, one of the offshore teams, the ones that controlled most of the platform, and they would stop what they were doing and they'd be grumpy and then they're reading a data scientist code. Hopefully there's no data scientists in the room, but if they're anything like ours, the code is not as clean uh, as what our platform team was doing. Uh, and then they're going to rewrite that because they were writing a lot in Python and they're going to rewrite in Java or try to choke through it and get some kind of wrapper around it. And then they're going to deploy the model. And back then, we had to redeploy the entire monolith. So you can imagine, if you wanted to iterate on your model like more than twice, this really, really sucked. And as a result, I think we only ever changed our first model we put into production with them three times because um, it wasn't worth arguing with the platform team and making them that unhappy to keep iterating on that model. So super bad framework for this. 
Today, this is what it looks like uh, for one specific example. So on the right here, we have the team in Rackspace, and this is our pipeline for news processing. So they've got crawlers piping news into here through that news receiver, they're queuing up articles, and then they're actually sending each article text over to a model that's extracting those names. Facebook's mentioned, LinkedIn's mentioned. Tag that up, they resolve that to some entity that we're actually uh, tracking within PitchBook, and then they send it on to wherever it needs to go. So the team, uh, our main platform team over here on Rackspace, has one big service that handles all that news, but over on AWS, this data scientist can deploy that model as much as he wants now. Because um, they're service oriented, he can just keep deploying as long as that endpoint's available. The main team actually doesn't care. Um, the, all they care about is if they can send 20,000 news articles a day to it or a million. It just needs to be scalable. Um, so we can use some nice tools on Amazon to scale out horizontally to handle that load really, really well. Um, and data scientists here just needs one engineer to support him uh, over on the Seattle side to be able to make sure this system is architected correctly. Uh, so for us, it made a ton of sense to be able to scale out that system on Amazon. Uh, and here over on the Rackspace side, there was no such need for any of that scale. They're kind of worried about a few different things on the news side. So this worked out actually super well for us, an example of a really early win that we had uh, adopting Amazon in conjunction with Rackspace. Um, notice I, I've been weaving in service oriented a little bit, and we didn't break out this new service into uh, a bunch of mini services or microservices. And there's a reason for that. Uh, something that we really learned along the way is that you can go crazy with this microservice approach. Uh, when we first thought we were going to do this, we were like single responsibility and like let's be event driven because every article on Medium says we should do that. Uh, yeah, Medium's a great teacher. And, and so we went that way. We went that way thinking, yeah, we're going to follow that and we're just going to figure out the benefits along the way because everyone's going there. Um, we tried like 50, 40, 50 services at first and the communication pains <laughs> that we were starting to have were ridiculous. I mean, one API change would happen on one side of the org and it's like two weeks later that finally propagated to every other team that was working on a service. It was, it was truly painful. Um, and the other thing we realized is we had no idea why we were splitting services. Like it just wasn't, we're just, we're splitting it because things needed to be split in single responsibility, we thought, uh, which didn't make any sense. And so uh, really specific examples, we had a search service that we were, we were rebuilding at the time. And so we decided hey, we have a team available in Europe and another team available on the other side of Europe. So if we split this thing into two services, we'd probably get done twice as fast. Makes sense, right? So uh, we split the search engine part that's actually uh, querying that data quickly and then the search result part, which is appending additional data to the result and handling the table. Um, and the problem is, is that well, now we have this beautiful HTTPS bottleneck in the middle of it. They're sending a lot of data back and forth. It's not a problem today, but if we doubled our data set, it's a problem immediately. There's ways to scale around this, but for effort, it's, I don't know if it's worth it. It was actually the wrong decision to split these services. What's even worse is we're claiming a service-oriented approach. We have one team that whenever they make a change to the engine, the team on, on the result side actually has to make a change. They're necessarily coupled because of this. So this is about the worst decision you could have made, uh, or worst reasoning you could have made to, to split a service, is having two teams in different cities that were available. So just be careful, I think. Uh, we like to think of ourselves as taking a mini service or, a, or even a medium service approach, uh, but just have a good reason for why you split services. Really think it through, and if somebody can't answer why you're splitting the service, I'd reconsider doing that. Because um, I think later down the line, you'll start to see uh, problems like this that you know or you're going to have to deal with. Back to some happier stories. So adding new data sets for us. Um, there are a lot of ways that we add data within PitchBook and some crawlers that do live on the platform, things like that. But one thing that was starting to happen is that we had researchers that would actually build a crawler on their local and whatever they were good at. Like one guy is like, oh yeah, I can automate getting these like 10,000 records of this thing if I just learn some Ruby and like Stack Overflow is super easy. So you end up with all of these crawlers and, and these feature extractors trying to get like a founded date off of uh, investor websites or something, right? And so they're getting all this, they're putting in a CSV, they're throwing it like a file share or something. The offshore devs stop what they're doing, they import it into the SQL database, and then we populate the new one, we run the switch, and now we're, we're live. I mean, that's pretty painful if you want to actually really scale up the amount of data. Um, probably when we were doing this, we were around like 200,000 companies in PitchBook. We're probably about a million right now. Um, and that's just company-wise. Each company's got hundreds and hundreds of data points, maybe even thousands of data points with it. Um, so the amount of scale that, that you're trying to add data, this is not the way you want to go. So let's show you the monster that we built now. So this is the new architecture for adding data sets. So a couple things that we've done is uh, we decided that whole research side was going to live on Amazon. Um, the main reason is, is that they need to scale up and actually be able to crawl and extract data 
from those results quickly to understand accuracy, quality, and to understand uh, not just with the extractors, but the data themselves, the data itself. We actually have to see if somebody's putting a revenue article in the news, is that actually correct? We need people to go through at least a sample of that to understand. So, so the teams on, on the research side really have a need to constantly be running these crawlers, constantly be running these feature extractors. Whereas the team over here on the right is really just worried about the stability um, of actually our storage system and their ability to transform that for use within the platform. Um, they really don't care about scale. They're, they're actually, they're only publishing data once per day. Uh, once every 24 hours, they publish data to our production database. So they have no need to even consume all of the data um, immediately that these teams are producing. Uh, so what we've done, we have feature extractors up there on the high left. Um, those can be written in whatever they want, and they nice they scale out nicely for us. Each researcher can write uh, something to extract the founder's name, or they can extract a revenue data point, or whatever it is. Then we have a nice crawl service that we abstracted away. We noticed everybody was writing about 70% of the same crawler, um, so that was kind of dumb. So we thought, hey, let's abstract that out. We'll make one person responsible for a very scalable crawl service um, that can crawl actually a variety of documents uh, to make it available for the feature extractors. We orchestrate all of that, and then we give our researchers a nice UI to be able to manage that whole process. Um, have a nice little pipeline DB there that's actually just saving state for everything, and then we put the data uh, in an S3 bucket. So. Lesson learned, again, different SLAs for these teams. Team on the right doesn't care about ingesting data quickly. right? They just care about keeping that system reliable um, and the integrity of the data set. So what we did is we wrote initially to that Pulsar API block right there, and that was the API that interfaced directly with our kind of source of truth database. So we tried a bunch of parallel requests and just pounded this thing, and it was down in like two minutes um, from the, the folks on AWS trying to write a bunch of data to it. So something that we learned, again, is that Different teams have different SLAs, and they may not be willing to change or have any reason to change. Um, so what we do is a strategy we use is, is heavy use of queuing um, between teams that have different SLAs. And so every time that we may have a new batch of like, oh, here's like 10,000 entities right, that we've just crawled and extracted some data point for, we're going to throw those into a queue. This team can now consume messages from the queue at any pace they're comfortable with that their systems can handle. Um, and then they're just going to, every time they get a note that something's available, they hit the API gateway, they go take the data from the store uh, and do whatever kind of write process they want at whatever processing speed that they want. Um, so definitely, again, think about what SLAs these teams actually have, what do they actually need to be doing, the most important tasks they need to be doing, uh, and make sure you have some kind of plan to deal with the differences or the dissonance in that. Um, so again, something that we learned really the hard way. So what's next for us? Uh, I didn't talk about deployment tooling at all. Um, I think a lot of microservices talks especially talk about deployment. We're still not there. We have some folks in AWS, like naturally have like this really great Jenkins pipeline, full CI CD and everything. I think other teams are still working towards it. So something that we still want to solve. Um, everything's not fully portable. So like I showed you, some processes are, are running longer on AWS than they are on Rackspace. I, we haven't fully solved that. So if my nightmare scenario happens and Rackspace does fall into a sinkhole in our main data center, uh, we're not going to be able to get all of our applications there, or we're going to suffer in performance. And I, I would like that peace of mind someday. Um, troubleshooting. This one has been a huge pain. Um, have the right monitoring tools. Uh, imagine trying to trace an error on like three different services that are all living on three different clouds. It is a pain to figure out how to do that. Uh, we were using New Relic. Uh, and it, we don't have it set up, I don't think, to give us enough information. And even now, like our, our time, our troubleshooting time, whenever the platform does go down, uh, is at least two to three times longer uh, now because our team is still learning how to effectively trace these errors back to root cause um, and resolve those quickly. Um, there's some fault tolerance and failover stuff that I think you can naturally adopt with architectures like this, but you still need to do that root cause analysis to understand what's going on with your system. So having the right monitoring is, is really crucial, um, and you have to pay attention to it. We're not good at it right now, um, and definitely something we want to work on. Um, lastly, our DevOps crew is the one that's responsible for pretty much all the things on this slide, and so we're super reliant on like two and a half people right now. <laughs> the system goes down, like uh, literally our, right now our process goes, like get on this Slack channel that the platform's down, and then the engineers have a sheet that says find someone from DevOps within 20 minutes. I mean, it, it is super reliant on these people um, for troubleshooting uh, and also for, for moving forward on these things. So that's our story. I actually think, uh, again, a lot of wins that we really did have. We're very happy with the migration, and I definitely think we have a new mindset on that we do want to live on maybe even not just two clouds, but maybe three, to be able to have that portability and give every team the right tool set for whatever job they want to do. Um, really giving each team the power to just make their own choices and run as fast as they can has probably been one of the best things we've ended up doing for our engineering organization. So really happy with the direction we've got. We still have a ways to go. 
hopefully you guys learned something from it. What questions? Uh, well, how do you recommend right sizing your services? Uh, how, basically, given the experience you had, how, how do you feel like you would, what would you tell yourself about how to evaluate uh, a, a team or, or, or a given function for uh, for the strategy? How, how would you do that? Yeah, so like, just basically how would I go about uh, now what I know, breaking up our organization and the services. And, and yeah, I mean, for us, I think a great approach was just to look at where would you make the first level natural breaks? Like, so we're looking across our applications and we're just saying, okay, like the natural breaks for us is like we have profiles that display a bunch of data. We have search that is helping people get to that data, right? Uh, we had like another general search thing. Uh, we have some account stuff that needed to be generalized. Like if we had just taken these things, I guess dashboard would have been another. So if we had just taken these things, it's like their logical separations as we almost talk about them in the org, um, that's pretty much where we ended up landing uh, at the end. I think that would have been a really good first step instead of just trying to say like, oh yeah, we have this, this general search service. So first like we need like one part that handles this and then the actual lookup and then maybe we want the result to be another thing. Um, so I, I would flip that approach and just what are those natural breaks and start there. Yeah, I mean, with the search result one, so it's when we started load testing. Um, so what, what we did is like our normal load tests were something like close to production, like plus a 25% because our user, our load doesn't vary that much actually. It's, it's pretty predictable. Um, and then we just decided, hey, like we're on these new systems, these new approach, we should actually just test scale to understand how much runway we have um, if, if, to account for user growth and data growth. And so it's when we did that load testing that actually, and, and really amped it up, that we started to see where the future bottlenecks were going to be. Um, yeah, that was probably the first thing. Um, and then I would say, yeah, the next best teacher is just rehosting things. But I would say, yeah, that was the first alarm. That was like, we had a big meeting. It's like, okay, we got a problem. Yeah, no problem. What services are you using? Rackspace, Colo, Managed Cloud, Description Services? Uh, just the Colo. Yeah, like uh, part of it is like, yeah, so for certain workloads, it's like we want a really specific size SSD with like exactly our hardware to run the load. And they've been doing that for a long time too. So the platform team feels like they know exactly what they can get out of their performance on that. And I think that was part of the pain of migrating to AWS is when they couldn't exactly tune everything they want to at that hardware level. But all trade offs. Yeah. Uh, I found uh, your presentation really useful. But one question that popped in mind is, Oh, would you mind sharing your company sharing the size or technical team involved? Look, Ten people, hundred people, like just a assessment? Yeah, absolutely. So it's scaled throughout this actually, because um, this is like you know I think the pamphlet says like a year and a half, and I put it like a three year timeline in there. So depending on when you say the migration started, um, probably I would say we're about forty engineers plus uh, QA and and some DevOps and everything on top of that. Maybe at the start of that, um, we're probably all said and done like one hundred and sixty right now. So it was like a big period of growth for us. Um, and I would say the process, like uh, the, the last diagram I showed uh, with the kind of monster machine over there, that's probably got about six developers and one DevOps over on the AWS side. And probably on this platform side, it had about 10 developers over on the, on the Rackspace side with maybe uh, three or four QA and maybe one DevOps supporting that. So a lot of growth during this. Was that growth attributed to this particular project or was that... Growth overall for the business. Growth overall for the business. There was a lot of demand of just like, hey, like again, it was like faster, more features. Like we, we had such this opportunity in the market that we really wanted to accelerate our ability to get in there before another competitor could. So it was a lot of that growth, but it definitely compounded problems. Like talk about bringing in developers, like new developers, trying to learn your code base in the middle of a transformation and add communication problems to it. Um, yeah, it was a whirlwind to deal with. Anybody else? Okay. Guys, thanks so much.